Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual online worship service for Wrightsville Community Church and all our visitors and guests. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Before we start, before I open this prayer, I just want to give thanks to those who participated in the coldest night of the year walk in raising funds for that uh, charity and for that event. And I want to thank all of those who participated in any way, shape, or form in this event. It's an incredible event. It's a necessary event. And we just so appreciate all those who have participated. So thank you very much for doing that. And I also want to thank those who, over the last week, since last Sunday, have shared with me their concerns of something that I, a comment that I made in Sunday's sermon. And it was not my intention to leave you with the impression that if you give a check that you're only doing that out of guilt. I know that many of us, myself included, we support charities and missions and ministries by check and many of us feel led, prompted, and guided by the Holy Spirit to do so. And I recognize that and we all do that. My point was coming out of the Good Samaritan passage was the expert in the law trying to justify himself that sometimes we cover up the fact that we're really functioning out of guilt. I know I've done that at times and so I just wanted to help us to discern our own personal motives and so if I miscommunicated that I am sorry for, for the, that comment that was not my intent but to help us to be aware that that might be a reason why we do the things that we do and if it is then we need to engage in a prayerful process of seeking the Lord's guidance of how we don't do that, but that we continue to support ministries and charities as he leads us and guides us. So my apologies to you if for offending you by that comment. That was not my intent, but I hope that we can continue to move forward, to continue to be good neighbors to one another and continue to support each other. And thank you for sharing those comments. Those comments, um, they can either stew in our minds and cause negativity or we can share them and we can deal with them and they don't become the means by which the enemy can work against us. So thank you for sharing that and I hope you have a great day today and thank you for joining us in worship and let's open our time together with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, thank you. We thank you for truth. We thank you for the truth of Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you for the truth that you put into our hearts and minds to live as people of honesty and integrity. And we thank you for the truth that we can share with one another, whether it's in sharing scripture or praying with one another, or even sharing the concerns that we have. And for those who've shared those comments, I just thank you for them and ask your blessing upon them. And as we come together to hear more truth, we thank you that the truth will set us free. We surrender ourselves to you and we ask your blessing upon our time together. And lead us and guide us that we might experience your fullness and all true glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Race Road. I'm Carter. And I'm Grace. And today we'll be playing three songs for you. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this great day. And thank you that we have the ability to worship you and praise you for all you've done for us. Just help us to always honor you and glorify you. In, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the first song we will be singing together this morning is You Are My All in All.
This is why I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow, or reap, or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add a single cubit to his height by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Learn how the wild flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the idolaters eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to for you. The next song we'll be singing is Open the Eyes of My Heart. Hello. We're going to continue on with our conversation around caring. Caring is the thing, the natural product that comes out of praying. As we pray for other individuals, God is going to show us and prompt us to care for them. And we need to know how it is that we can do that. What is God's take on this is what we're going to take a look at today. 
But there's something that I want you to see. It's a quote from a fellow by the name of Bob Hamp. And he says this. He says, it's one thing to say, God, I'm not going another step unless you go with me. That's the attitude that God wants us to have, as he wants us to journey alongside him. He doesn't want to tag along and, and, and follow us. He wants us to follow him. Now, he goes on and he says, it's another thing to say, God, this is where I'm going. I would prefer that you come along, but I'm going regardless. Have there been any decisions in your life where you've kind of carried that attitude? Whether it be, you know, a, a large purchase that you wanted to make, a relationship that you got into where you said, I, know, I don't really care, God, what you think about this. I'm going in this direction. I'm making this decision. I'm going to be doing this thing. You're either with me or without me, but I'm going that way. And as we talk about caring, we need to have the attitude of the very first statement there that says, I can't move without you. I need you to lead me in life. Because I know that if I'm going to fully be the person that you want me to be, I need to follow your lead and not you follow mine. One of the books that I've been reading over the last little while, and some of the information for this conversation today is from one by this fellow, Bob Hamp, and it's called Think Differently, Lead Differently. The intent and design in this book is for those who are spiritual leaders. And so when you think of a spiritual leader, you think of someone who's a pastor or a teacher or a life group leader or something like that. But I'm going to say that we are all spiritual leaders. We're all called to lead someone else spiritually, to help them on their journey with Jesus, to mentor them and guide them along, to be a good role model before them, but also to help them. When you think of the individuals in your life who've been instrumental in your development, in your maturing and growing in your faith walk, I'm sure you're every bit as thankful to them as I am to the individuals who imparted themselves and, and their time and their resources into me. And so likewise, we're called to do the same for other people. There's five different things that we're going to take a look at today. And what we're going to be looking at is caring by leading. As we lead individuals, here's five different things that we need to consider and look at when it comes to caring for them. The first is this, we need to have a kingdom focus. Not of me focus, but we need to filter all things through kingdom thinking, and we're going to look at that more. We also need to lead others to God. Our call in life is to do that very thing. We're also called to communion with God. And we're not talking about communion in the way of the bread and the drink and that kind of a thing. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. But we're also called to make disciples and not dependents. We'll look at that. The last thing is that free people, free people. And I like that one. That's one that we need to remember and we'll look at as well. But as we start at the beginning of being kingdom focused, there's a verse that I'm going to say is extremely worth underlining in your Bible. And so if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, we're going to take a look at this one. Whether it be in your phone or your tablet or your hard copy Bible, take a look at it, highlight it. Because when we take a look at what it means to be a spiritual individual, to be a follower of Christ, this really sums up what it is that he wants us to be focused on to be able to achieve his will. It says here in chapter 6, verse 33, I had it, and I'm going to come back to it. I apologize. It says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added or provided for you, depending on which translation you're looking at. It says here to seek first the kingdom of God. Our heart, our minds, our attitudes need to be kingdom focused. It's very easy to get caught up in the world system of which we're a part of. And everything around us is very temporary. The verses that lead up to this particular one talk about uh, being anxious about things, about not having different things. And Jesus tells the disciples and those who are listening, 
Doesn't God take care of the grasses around you and the flowers of the field and the birds of the air? And they're well cared for, right? Then why would we worry about the temporary things in this world? Because you mean much more to God than these other things that are just going to be burned up and aren't going to be anymore. And so in this, he says, I want you in all things, every day, in your attitude, in your approach to life, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so as we seek to care for other individuals and we seek to lead them, the first direction we need to lead them in is seeking after God. That's what they need. It's what each and every one of us need, is to have a heart that is motivated and moved and directed towards God himself. And so we need to have that, and we need to share and convey that with others as well, because that's why we were created. We're also called to lead others to God. And so as we're talking about uh, seeking first the kingdom, we need to lead them that way, and so we need to lead them directly to him. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, is a verse that Jesus quotes when tempted by Satan. When he was taken out into the desert for 40 days and was fasting out there, and then he was confronted by Satan and tempted three times, one of the temptations was to turn this, this stone into bread to feed yourself. You're very hungry. And Jesus' response is what uh, he reiterated what was in Deuteronomy 8.3, and it says, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In that, he's saying, Yes, we need to feast on the Word of God. That is really important. We need to read it. We need to digest it. We need to make it a part of ourselves. But when we talk about the things that come from the mouth of the Lord, we're also talking about the things that God says to us directly. We need to listen to His voice. It's not appropriate for us to say, I'm going in this direction, Lord, and no matter what you think about it, I'm going in this way. What we need to do is we need to be listening to what it is that he's saying, hear the directive from him, and follow that directive and go forward with him. Bob Hamp says this, he says, the number one activity that allows people to seek first the kingdom is listening to his voice. Now, you may be going, you know, I really want to hear from God. I try. I will pray and and, and I might even listen, but I don't hear him, or I, I kind of second guess whether or not what I'm hearing is from him, or am I only hearing what I want to hear, and that's all legitimate. I completely understand that, because I go through that same process myself. When I'm hearing from him, I want to make sure that it's his voice. I, I'm not hearing what I want to hear, so therefore I go in that direction, but I want to be at peace with what it is that I'm hearing. And I know that when I'm searching after what it is that God wants, when my heart is kingdom focused, when I am seeking after him and his righteousness, and then I hear something, I know that it's in line with what it is that he wants me to do and what he wants me to accomplish. And it's the very thing that he wants us to impart to others around us. Now, can you imagine if you only heard from God once a week and only from a trained professional, what a tragedy that would be. The only time you hear from God is through somebody else. Now take that a step further. Imagine that our children only heard from us what God has said, but never learned to hear God for themselves today. See, we need to teach them to hear his voice. But if you yourself are struggling with that and, and you don't quite know whether or not you're hearing from him or you're not modeling that, how is it that they're going to know how it is they need to do it? It's not enough to just talk about what he has said in his word, although his word is alive and it is speaking now, so don't misunderstand me. But we also in our prayer life need to hear from him the directives that he gives. And we need to teach our children and those that we're talking to and that we're caring by leading towards God how it is that they can hear His voice and recognize it as well. You know, if I was to toast up some, some English muffins, and, and who doesn't love English muffins, right? 
and, and I put it in, I got them sliced just right, and I want to get ready, and, and all of a sudden I'm like, okay, let's turn it on. And then they kick back up again. And I'm like, wait a second, why isn't that working? And I put it down, and then I, I check the buttons here to see, you know, is it is it right? If I have the right button, are they not pushed? And maybe you got to change and adjust the knob, and it's not that. Well, maybe I should try them in the other one. And then all of a sudden I look and I go, okay. I understand what the problem is. I'm not plugged in. And so if I plug the thing in and go, okay, I've got to test this because I mean, none of that was working, and then it goes down, I go, excellent, it's going to work. But what's working is, is that I am plugged into the power source. And what we ourselves need to do to be able to recognize God's voice is we need to be plugged into Him as our power source. And it's then that we will receive the feed that we need to, to be able to accomplish what it is that he wants us to do. The third thing is communion with God. And as I said, we're not talking about communion with bread and with drink. We're talking about something very different. If you take a look at John chapter 5, and I'm going to turn there if you want to turn with me. John chapter 5, verse 39. It says this, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them. Yet, they testify about me. In this passage, what he's doing is he's talking to the Pharisees and he's saying, look, you know, you can read the scriptures over and over and over again and, and you can be looking for different things and you can say, you know, I'm going to do this with my life or that with my life and make the scriptures say what you want them to say. But you know, what's really interesting about all of scripture is that it testifies about Jesus. It's talking about him. It's pointing to him. And so if we're going to seek the kingdom of God, we need to seek it through Jesus Christ. If we're going to lead others to God, we need to lead them to Jesus because he's the one that connects us. He is the power source that connects us to God himself. And so what we're looking at here isn't so much a devotional life that we need people to develop, but it's communion. And there is a difference. And here's the difference. When you talk about a devotional life, you can do all of the right things. And for those of you who maybe have a regular devotional life, you would attest to this where you've spent time studying the Word of God. You have spent a significant amount of time praying. And yet, even after all of that activity, you still feel a level of disconnection or it's quiet, and you're not hearing from him. And you go, I'm doing the right things. I know my activity is right, but why is it not producing what I want it to produce? And that's why when it comes to what it is we're supposed to do in our relationship with God, we're called to commune with him, to listen to him, to allow him to speak to us. We potentially teach others to have a form of godliness, that lacks the power of God's presence. You know, even on a Sunday morning, or, you know, when we gather as a church, we can do all of the right things. We can do the prayers. We can read the, uh, the right scriptures. We can sing songs. We can preach the message, and we can share what it says in God's word. But if the Holy Spirit isn't present, people can still leave empty. Toast is ready. We don't want to leave empty. When we spend time with God, when we commune with Him, whether it be on a personal level or whether it be on a corporate level, we want to be filled. We want to have a God encounter. And as Christians, that is something that we ourselves long for, but it's also what the world needs. They need God encounters. And so as we lead people to God, we lead them to a holy encounter with Him, caring by leading. The next thing is disciples, not dependents. This is very important. It's the kind of thing where Jesus says to us, look, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. It's the last thing He said before He left. We see that in Matthew 28. So as he tells us to go out and make disciples of the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the, uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit, he says, look, I want you to know I'm with you. And in that I'm with you, it's I'm talking to you. I will lead you. I will guide you. I will direct you. And as we're called to make disciples, 
We're, we have to recognize we're not called to make people dependent, dependent upon us for their spiritual life, nor are we called to make them dependent upon the church for their spiritual life. Yes, people get nourished here. People get rejuvenated. People get trained, equipped, and readied. But we can't get to a point where we're so dependent upon others or the church itself that we are stagnant and unable to go out and make other disciples. And so therefore, we are trying to help people become disciples of Jesus, not dependence on humans or human systems. We need people to launch and to launch well. They need to be able to get their own footing in their own faith, networked with everyone else, but they are called just as we are called and we are all individually called to go and make disciples of those around us. The last thing is to free people, or sorry, free people, free people. And it's one of those kind of things where we ourselves are free because we have been freed from the bondage of sin. We are freed from the life that we used to have, and we are called to go likewise and free other people. If we care about people, then we're going to lead them into the freedom that only Jesus can offer. Freedom from all of that stuff that we have regrets about, all of the shame that we've had, the guilt that we carry, freedom from all of those things. He wants us to be filled with Him. He wants us to have life abundant, the one that only He can give, one that is filled with peace and joy and love, mercy and grace and kindness and compassion. And so in that, we're called to, as free people, free others as well from the bondage of sin that they are entrenched in. And, and it may be hard to see because they're, they're just living a regular life just like you and I, and they're going to school and they're doing their homework, they're writing tests, they're doing exams, they, they have a job, they have a car, they have whatever. They look very normal. And the people around us are. But there's a significant difference between ourselves and those who have yet to know Christ. And that difference is the fact that They're not free. They are still in bondage to the sin that they have in their lives. And until they make that decision to allow Christ to take that all away and say, Lord Jesus, I am so sorry for the things that I have done. Would you take this away from me? Would you lead my life? Until they get to that point of wanting to be freed, they're not there yet. But we as free people are called to go and free people. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 7, actually I'm going to say it's in verse 8, but if you look at 7 and 8 together, it has the same thing built into it together. It says, freely you have received, freely give. In the same way that you have received your freedom, how could you hold on to that and not share that level of freedom with somebody else? How awful would it be? If somebody got to the finish line only to realize that they didn't have what they needed to get into heaven. You had it. You carried it with you your whole, well, however long you were saved. You could be living in close proximity to these people, but if you never share with them the greatest thing that you have, what a crime. Each and every day, I'm always going through my mind what it is that I can do to possibly reach out to those who are in close proximity to me or those who are in my sphere of influence, that, that regular track that I have in life where I get my gas and what convenience store I go to, what grocery store I go to. How can I reach these people who are in my life each and every day? How can I help free them? It may take a little bit of creativity. It's going to take prayer. But what it's going to take also is care. Do we care enough about those around us and where their eternal situation is or is not that we're actually going to go to the length that someone else did for us to share the good news with them? We're not trying to lead people into a performance, but into a relationship and ultimately into a condition. See, we don't want to make people into moral individuals. I can say honestly, for a long time, I think that's what churches were actually doing. They're trying to get people to 
toe the party line to this is what a good church person looks like and therefore you should do life this way, you should look this way, wear these clothes. I'll never forget when I was working at Tip Top Tailors uh, in London when I was back in uh, Bible college and this fellow came in, he was kind of a Rastafarian guy and he had dreadlocks and he came in and uh, he said, I'm looking for a suit. And typically, I just said, are you going to a wedding or a funeral or what is it that you need the suit for? And, and he said, well, I've started going to this new church. And he said, uh, one of the people in the church came up to me this week and they said, it's time. I said, it's time for what? He said, well, they told me it's time for me to get my suit. And I knew exactly which church he was talking about in town. Because they're all about rules and regulations and legalism and all of those kinds of things. That's not what we're calling people into. We're seeking to free them, not enslave them. This condition that we're talking about is not something that is achieved by striving or by any kind of effort. It is something that springs naturally from proximity and connectedness. As we talked about communion, we want to help people to be able to commune with God. We need them to move into the close proximity of Jesus and to do things like reading his word and praying and listening and allowing him to speak. We want them to understand what it means to be in a relationship with him and to allow him to lead their lives. And we are showing the utmost of care to any and every individual that we spend the time helping them direct, direct them in this way, in his way, helping them to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Bob Hamp said this, and this is what I want to leave you with. He said, we cannot lead others into a place that we have not gone or are not going. I've said this oftentimes. It's one of those kind of things where you can only take someone as far as you yourself have gone. I, I remember an individual that uh, they used to work in a bar and uh, they were going to church at one time in their life and then they stopped going and, and they wouldn't say to, that they weren't a Christian anymore, but they, uh, they just, you know, they, well, they lost touch with the church. So they didn't have one that they were going to. And then they started to talk to their other people in the place of work about Jesus or trying to reach out to them. And, and they were telling me this. And I said, okay, that's, that's great. I mean, that's good. You should be doing that. But what happens when they make a decision to follow Christ? What are you going to do with them then? Like, are you going to then start going to church yourself? Or how confusing is that going to be if you say the next step is you should go to church, but you yourself aren't going? So you can only take someone as far as you yourself are going. And so when it comes to trying to lead someone and help them to grow in their spiritual life, if you're not growing, and if you're not doing anything intentional to develop yourself, you're only going to be able to take that person as far as you yourself are. And so it's one of those things where we have to take a look at ourselves. We have to say, if I am a follower of Jesus, what is it that I'm doing to further enhance and develop as a Christian? Am I growing? Am I communing with God? Am I seeking first His kingdom in my life so that I can help others to do the same in theirs? I'm going to leave that question with you because only you can answer that. I'm also going to encourage you to pray about it and to ask God, God, am I where you want me to be? What should I be doing now? I want to hear from you. Would you direct me? as far as what you want from me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to plug into you as our power source. You have told us through your son Jesus that we are to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. We need to ask ourselves, are we doing that? Are we doing that consistently? Are we allowing you to lead or are we leading our lives and just saying, hey, you can come along if you want to, but I'm, I'm going this way. Or are we saying, 
I'm not going to go. I'm not going to take a step unless you're coming with me, unless you guide me, because I only want my life to be led by you. Father, we recognize that you want us to care for those around us, but as we examine caring, it's not a matter of just being nice to other people. That's not the care that you're looking for. What you're looking for is someone who is going to go the extra mile for someone, that is going to be intentional about helping them understand who you are, but more than head knowledge, you're going to help them experience who you are. You're going to speak of your own personal experiences. We're going to speak of our own personal experiences, but you're also going to have us help them have a personal experience with you, which starts with faith and goes from there. Father, I pray that you would help us to see clearly who it is that you want us to care for in this way, how it is that we're to care for them. Guide us through what we're to say and when we're to say it, what action steps we should be doing to role model before them what it means to have a really good relationship with you, but two, how can we also guide them along and help them in their journey? Father, we ask that you would lead us in this way so that we in turn can care by leading as well. And we ask for your help in this in Jesus' name. Amen. The last song we will be singing together this morning is In Christ Alone. Mm -hmm. 